This morning we'll see if you're a man of my word. Because I've talked with many of you throughout the week, and I've said it may be a short sermon. Uh, I appreciate the value of your prayers and helping me deal with this cold, and especially that it has not gotten worse. But we're not here to talk about my sinus infection, but by the blood and body of Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we gather here this day to worship and honor and glorify you. You deserve all the glory and honor that the world can offer in the inside. Help us to realize, oh dear, this little meal has so much meaning that we're just beginning to scratch the surface. I know, dear Lord, I myself, after 40 years, I'm just even beginning to even find a new layer of what you want us to learn from this holy meal. In Christ's name, amen. As I said this morning, it's all about communion. Or do I mean it's all about Eucharist? Or is it all about the Lord's Supper? Or is it about breaking bread? It's all the above. It's a name given to the same thing. But each connotating something different. The Lord's Supper is fundamentally its original name and is intended to evoke our heart's remembrance of the divinity and blessing of Jesus in that Lord's Supper. That meal with his disciples, who we included here today in that, do this in remembrance of him. It is our Lord's Supper. He wants us to do it. To remember that wonderful evening, but also his life and death and resurrection. One which we don't hear is often breaking of bread. Now, that's not when you try to go make a sandwich. <laughs> but this is seen in Acts 2, 42 through 46. It depicts the early church coming together in fellowship and in unity, breaking bread and having the Lord's Supper. Another term which doesn't flow as easily off of our tongues. It sounds strange. It's because it's Latin. Eucharist. It comes from Eucharistus. And it comes from the words in each of the episodes in which uh, tells of that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and Corinthians. Jesus took the bread and gave thanks. This is Thanksgiving. This is true thanksgiving. The early church fathers really were forethinkers because they knew if they called it thanksgiving, what would us Americans do? <laughs> what would we over have a turkey dinner? No. This is thanksgiving. Giving thanks to God. And, and that meaning has, for me, just especially within the past few weeks, hit more <coughs> Because a lot of times when we come to this meal, Lord, bless this meal so I may be blessed. Is how it normally approach. Remind us of what it is. <clears throat> That's not what Jesus did. He gave thanks. He had already received the blessing and encouraged us, us too to not be in anticipation of what we desire and need. He says, I've, I've already fulfilled it. Give thanks. Celebrate. Salvation has come. Rejoice in it. Give thanks for your Savior came and died for you. The last one, which is more commonly known among us, is the word communion. And that is derived in that 1 Corinthians 10, 16 passage, 
is not this cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ? And is this not the bread which we break a participation in the body of Christ? We participate, we commune with Christ. We have fellowship with Christ. We come together. Community is found in that. Not only with us and God, but with us and each other. But why do we do this? Well, it is what the church calls an ordinance. And there's actually only two ordinances which the church really practices. But what do we mean by an ordinance? It is basically a practice commanded to be performed by the church from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, do it. And here's why. It's usually it's a testimony of our call or remembrance. It's a testimony we especially see in baptism, the other ordinance. We testify who we are and new in Jesus Christ and that we are desiring to follow him and claim our identity in him. That is who we are. We celebrated that just a few weeks ago with Strider. Now we're looking at the other ordinance. Not what only the individual has done, but what the community, the family has. A Savior who came, left heaven above, died for you and me. We have salvation. But what can we say this whole communion is about? <laughs> I'm going to give you a list. Now this is not a end-to-end -end, end all list. This is just some of the things which I've acquired over the years. And you probably have more in. But one which I've already mentioned. Giving thanks. This is Thanksgiving. How many times I, I've come to this table seeking, first of all, repentance and making myself right with God. And then asking God to help me stay the steady course by keeping this cup in my as a physical reminder of what he did for me. That is so true. I need that. But it's not all about gimme, gimme, gimme. It's praise God, praise God, praise God. You've already done it. Help me see it and celebrate it. Celebrate the joy of my salvation. Celebrate Jesus in my life by telling others. Giving thanks. It's not only that. But we also look forward to the day when we will take this anew with Jesus. He told his disciples that night, I will not partake of this cup until I back again, until I bring my kingdom in. What a day that will be when we can sit and be at the table of the Heavenly Father with Jesus by our side. Peter, Moses, each one of you, sitting there at the table in that grand dining hall of heaven in the presence of God and knowing that we're not no longer enemies, we're not only guests, we are sons and daughters of God through our brother Jesus Christ and it's family reunion time. Let the cup flow. But we also see this going back using the Old Testament of what it was originally intended. Each of the elements. How it was a sign for what would take place and for a reminder for us. The bread as I mentioned with the kids, was originally to say, your Savior is coming. It's going to be a quick flight. 
You don't have time to worry about getting your bread ready. You're leaving slavery. Your Savior has come. So have this meal. Tomorrow you're leaving. Tomorrow you're free. Jesus came, took on human form, showed us the way to freedom through the cross. He showed it by a living holy life. A life without sin. Like that bread is without yeast, Jesus was without sin. Showing that holiness is available through him. And that we celebrate that. That we have freedom, we are free in Christ, which we just talked about last Sunday. And we celebrate today. The cup reminds us that when that death angel came over Egypt, all those who were covered by the blood on their doorposts of the Lamb were saved. Death could not have a hold on them. We have the blood of Jesus Christ who paid for our sins and death has no hold on us. Amen. We celebrate that. We live, not only live eternally with Christ, but we have the abundant life that Christ has promised. Over the years, another way I look at this too. The world tries to celebrate every day with a new holiday. Yes, tomorrow is shoelace day or whatever. Ice cream with chocolate topping day, whatever. They will make a day out of it. And the whole world's supposed to join in. But we don't have to. Yes, we have Christmas and Easter and Pentecost. But here, we don't have to wait till December 25th. We don't have to wait till April or March whenever Easter arrives each year. April or March, yeah. <laughs> Making sure my months are correct. <laughs> Communion helps us to celebrate it every time we partake. Whether we do it monthly, weekly, or maybe even daily in our homes with our families. Why do I say that? The bread. Philippians 2 tells us, Jesus left all the glory of heaven, poured himself out in, as a servant, a humble servant, lived among us without sin. There's Christmas. Jesus born in the manger, without sin, living among us. Then comes Easter. Jesus died. He poured out his blood for you and me. We celebrate not only that cross, but more importantly, what comes after that cross, the resurrection. So I don't have to wait to December 25th and April 16th or whatever day it is. I can do it each day. I have that joy in my life. I can celebrate it with every child of God and have that joyous festivity in my life. And this is my way of celebrating it. It does not involve forcing my ideas on anyone else. This is our family. It's having a reunion. Celebrating the holidays. Also reminds me of where I need to be. We are told in Corinthians that we must come before the table with a pure heart. That doesn't say pure lives, but a pure heart. That's the difference? Because I can mess up. I can sin. Hopefully not intentionally. But what I'm saying is we don't have to get everything right with our actions before we take. We have to get our heart right with God. Seek forgiveness. And if I need to, seek reconciliation with maybe those who have offended. But I don't have to make restitution before I can partake. I seek God. Asking for His forgiveness. So I can see Him clearly. And make Him once again. The number one priority in my life. 
is a way of centering myself once again in my Father. By giving Him praise and thanksgiving, celebrating His birth and resurrection, and so much more. But a lot of times I think what we have done is look at this meal as an individual between us and God. But the word is communion, people. Have we really considered that we are united at this table? Not just like the states of America. We say we're united, but how many times have we succeeded from each other? Yes, South Carolina and the rest of the South did. But do you know how many different parts of the states attempted to? I know there's a portion in Illinois which at one time tried to succeed. Why? It wasn't over slavery or anything. It's just they weren't receiving any attention from the rest of the state. All the highways went around it. And so they got no economic growth. So they tried to reach out to Canada. Would you accept this? And there were other parts of the country which did the same. Maybe not with Canada, but because they weren't getting recognition, they tried to succeed. It's a, a loosely knit association we have here in the States. But when we're united in Christ, that's a different story. We do know that Christ wants us to be united. As I said earlier, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Corinthians give us the story of the supper itself. Why not John? Well, he does, but doesn't at the same time. He tells us what occurred beforehand. He washed Peter's feet and the rest of the disciples' feet. And Peter going, oh no, not me, Lord. Yes, you too. And then Judas being said, go do what you have to do. Then, what is admitted is the meal. But then, after that, before they go out to the garden, Jesus gets a long discussion and a prayer for his disciples, those 11 and us today, that we may be united, just as Jesus was united with the Father, that we would be united with him and with each other. Not just this vertical relationship, but this horizontal one as well. We need to be united. All this prayer, all this discussion is going around this table. And when you think about it, why a table? Why not? Think about it. When is the family truly united? Not just church family, your personal family. When you're sitting around the dining room table. You're not with the cell phones out, mind you. But you're focusing on each other. You're sharing something in common. Sharing of your lives. The individuals of that family unit become one. This is not only within the family, but we see this throughout the Middle East and in Europe. There's a sense of welcoming in, the hospitality when one is welcomed in to join in a meal with another family. It's saying, we are in agreement with you. We want to be united with you. Come, have fellowship with us. Partake of the same meal. We are not fighting factions. We are finding something common and gathering in peace and love. And when one of us is hurting, the other will be there. Many wars were stopped just because people sat down around a table together and talked. What's this going to do with communion? 
Well, Paul several hints of this in chapter 10. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks and participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread we may break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. We come from different backgrounds, and Christ wants us to be those individuals he's created us to be. But we are a body. We need to recognize our commonality. To come in love, sit with our Lord. Not wait until when we do physically in, in that new heaven and earth, but even now. Just looking not only at our Lord, but realizing because we have this commonality, what we partake of in Christ, so are you. And when one of us is suffering, because we are one body, all of us <clears throat> should be suffering. Now, that mean, does not mean that if Keith breaks an arm, that we all have to, oh, my elbow. <laughs> no. But let's think beyond that. We've talked about this morning, and I think it's the Lord's timing on this, the whole idea of human trafficking. How many Christians been caught up in that. Are our hearts sad? Or are we too busy? Well, it's not me at least. It's not my children. So, praise the Lord. But are we praying for them? Are we united in our grief with them? Do we come to the table broken seeking our Heavenly Father to intervene? Or to use us to help intervene? The table unifies us. But we have used it as a way of distancing ourselves. Because I need to get right with God. You do your thing, I do mine. But it's me and God. No, it's all of us. Each and every one of us. It doesn't always have to be about even just human trafficking. How did we partake of the supper when 9-11 took place? Did we just do it go through our normal routine? Or were we in grief because of those brothers and sisters who died in that? How about what is still going on in the Ukraine? Churches are bombed. People have no place to worship. They are running for their lives. And here we are sitting by Oh, yes, it's time for communion. No. Let this be a time as a reminder that when one part of the body of Christ aches, all of us aches. And then, because we who may be blessed share in our blessings to help those in need so that the body can be whole because of the body of Christ. This table is called to bring us together just as the Son is to the Father. We are to each other because of the Son. He has set us free, yes, but not set us free to do whatever we darn well please. We are set free to honor God and be there for each other, love one another, help one another. These are just some of the things which I've been learning more and more about communion. I'm not sure what may have hit home with you. You may have known all that. You may even know more. I'm going to know more from you. Why does communion mean, mean to you? I would love to have that discussion with you. Because, yes, I've gone to seminary. Yes, I've been preaching for nearly 30 years. But folks, I don't know everything. need to learn. But more importantly, we need to learn and love together. Amen. The supper's here. We'll be partaking that in just a minute. I'll pray, and Keith will have the song, and then we'll partake.
Lord, I just want to thank you for this time that we could gather here today to talk about how this table, while it reminds us of salvation and the freedom that we have, and we're, we're just so grateful for it. But dear Lord, you did not create us to be independent, but dependent upon you and leaning upon each other. When one hurts, we all hurt. Help us to celebrate, but to spread the love, spread the concern, spread the blessings. Thank you for this day. Help us to honor you in the right way. In Christ's name, amen. Turn to hymn three. 